Good afternoon. One of our guests was commenting a minute ago and said, the salad would go was good, what's next? The salad. This is a fundraiser. I would have had pimento cheese sandwiches if I could have gotten away with it. Thank you all again for being here. Madonna Badger is a leader, some would say a disruptor in her industry. She is the founder and chief creative officer of Badger and Winters Advertising in New York. Madonna is distinctive and distinguished. From groundbreaking advertising featuring Mark Wahlberg when he was Marky Mark, and Kate Moss, both for Calvin Klein, to Kalia by Carrie Underwood for Dick's Sporting Goods. Madonna Badger and Badger and Winters have created in the top of mind awareness of international consumers such brands as Procter & Gamble, Diane von Furstenberg, Chanel, Pepsi, Godiva, Vera Wang, and the repositioning of J.C. Penney's national brand platform. Good luck. <laughs> but if anyone can do it. Madonna is recognized through countless awards, not only from advertising age, but also from Cannes to the United Nations. And Madonna is conscious, leading her industry and all of us really, on the important subject, indeed the necessity for understanding the personal and societal impact of gender bias and gender equality. <laughs> Madonna's personal story is compelling. I'll leave that to her to share with you. But the lives of all of us who got to know Madonna during her time here in Arkansas were not only enlightened, but enriched. And she has left all who have heard her story better for the experience. Welcome, Madonna Badger. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Craig. I'm going to put this over here. Can, uh, can you hear me? Everybody OK? Is it on? Just give me a yes or a no. OK. <laughs> Um, so, um, I just first want to thank everyone for being here um, and for asking me to be here today. Um, I'm, it's a, an honor um, that I can't even uh, really, I can't imagine. Um, and being in the governor's mansion and um, having all of you come and having all of these seats being filled, um, it just, it, uh, really makes me feel really just beautiful and good inside. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you so much, Craig, for asking me to be here. Um, it is a deep honor. So um, I want to tell you a story. So a couple of uh, months ago, I decided to take a um, 23andMe genetic test. Because in my family, there's a big, um, you know, the, the myth or the idea or the legend was that we were Cherokee Indian. Cherokee Indian, and we were Mi'kmaq, because my mother is from Newfoundland. Um, I was also born in Newfoundland. And uh, so I get the test back, and I'm thinking, like, okay, here it comes. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, like, you know, a really high spiritual being in the Indian nation. <laughs> And I get it back, and I'm a Neanderthal, okay? <laughs> I have 0% Native American blood. I am a Neanderthal, and I'm so Neanderthal that I am actually one of the highest amounts they've ever seen at 23andMe. And I'm so Neanderthal 
that uh, my great-grandmother to the 250th power was 100% Neanderthal. Now, I think about my grandma to the 250th power from time to time. And mostly what I think about is what her life was like. Was she killing a deer? Was she making dinner? Was she watching the snowfall? And I think about, honestly, all the generations that got me to standing here today in Little Rock, Arkansas. And all the many, many generations that got all of you here today. And what a miracle each and every person is in this room. And how it's like one, one bad love letter or one bad divorce and, you know, that child wasn't born and I didn't make it, you know, or whatever. So the theme a lot about what I want to talk about today is about that idea of miracles and how miracles happen. So my father was uh, stationed in Newfoundland from Kentucky. He was part of the MP group that guided, uh, that guarded, sorry, the um, uh, B3, B2 bombers that were constantly flying above the globe uh, during the, the uh, Cold War. And my mother was the daughter of a fisherman and, um, in, in Newfoundland on a really tiny village. And she was one of nine children. Three of them had died from uh, parasites from my grandmother shearing sheep. And um, the, my mother um, was deemed the smartest of all the, the nine remaining children. And so she was sent to Montreal to go to secretarial school. And she became the secretary of the CO of the Air Force Base where my father was stationed. And they fell head over heels in love and they were married the day after Christmas, and I was born shortly thereafter in Newfoundland. Um, so I think that's a miracle. We moved to Kentucky, and uh, my parents were really into education. Um, they were like, you know, practically, well, they did beat me, but they didn't know better in those days. Um, but, um, but they were tough, and we had to have a good education. And, my father worked like three jobs. He went to school for the GI Bill. My mother babysat kids in our house. I mean, we were poor. We, you know, scrambled eggs for dinner. And, um, but the, they wanted me to work hard. And I did, and I went to a very prestigious university. I then um, went from there, I met people, and I became, through uh, a series of events, um, the senior art director at Calvin Klein. And this was during a time when Calvin was in really bad shape and was losing the company. And I did the Marky Mark campaign and the Kate Moss campaign. And I made Kate Moss skinny, er, and uh, I gave Marky Mark abs. And I did a lot of other things uh, just like that. And, um, at the ripe age of 29, I thought, you know what? This is bull crap. I'm gonna start my own agency. <laughs> Which is like a joke, because I had the greatest job in the world. And, uh, but I had a petty cash box, and I started my own company and at 29, and I'm 54 now, and I've had it since then. Um, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved pitching. I loved winning. I loved changing light bulbs. I loved getting the computers fixed. I loved everything there was to love about having my own company. I found a guy, and he was in recovery like me. Uh, I, w I got into recovery at 27. On March 29th, I will have 28 years without a drink or a drug. Um, which is basically how Cosmo saved my life. Um, but anyway, so um, 
and I just kept moving, you know, uh, just kept working. Whoops. Okay, I'm going to need this in a sec. Uh, so anyway, so I um, married him and kept working, and then um, I got pregnant. And I got pregnant, and I had Lily in 2002. And I had then twins in 2004, um, Sarah and Grace. And then I decided that the husband thing wasn't really working out so hot. So I divorced him, and, um, but we were great co-parents. And I bought a beautiful house, um, or I thought it was a beautiful house, in Connecticut so my children could go to school. Um, they were all dyslexic, and so there was an excellent uh, school close to where I bought this house, as opposed to, um, you know, living in New York. And it was Christmas Eve, and uh, I loved being a mom. Um, once I had my children, that love was unlike anything I'd ever felt. And anyway, on Christmas Eve 2011, my house uh, caught on fire. And um, it, it caught on fire in such a way that the smoke went up through the walls and right to the, where the children were sleeping. And so they died probably very quickly. And my parents died uh, trying to save them. And I woke up um, in the smoke and uh, I went outside um, and went up the scaffolding thinking that was the best way to save them because the house was full of smoke and I couldn't get in. And uh, if you think you're in control of your life, if you think you know anything, that all fades away when you're in sub-zero weather on a scaffolding with the smoke so thick you can't even see and the fire so hot you can't even get in to save your own children. That's when you know that you have no control in this world. And uh, anyway, it all felt like it went by so slowly, but it actually went by very quickly. And um, the fire department came, and you know, I also thought they were outside. Maybe they, my parents had already saved them. Anyway, um, so that was the beginning of my new story. And uh, I was, you know, I went to all kinds of, everybody kept throwing me into uh, psychiatric institutes, institutions, and they all thought I was crazy and, uh, or gonna kill myself. So I went into a series of psychiatric hospitals and uh, one was worse than the next and nobody knew what to do with me. Uh, I literally would have doctors come in and sit down next to me and just cry and be like, I can't imagine being you. <laughs> and I'm like, what the F is going on here, man? You're supposed to be helping me. What is going on? And you know what, the only thing that helped me was going to meetings at Silver Hill, at the vile uh, Presbyterian whatever within my own community. It was the only place where I was safe to be me, have my fear, have my, uh, my you know, I mean, to say sorrow is ridiculous, um, my deep trauma and grief and not, you know, I mean, people, you know, sometimes people would try to tell, oh, you should read this book or you should read that book. And if, if there's anyone here that's going through the loss of someone, 
You know, it's okay to say, I don't need any feedback. I don't need any book suggestions or movie suggestions right now. I just need you to love me. Like, that's all I really need. Um, so anyway, the only person that uh, really came and helped me um, and the only person I really trusted even to call was from that prestigious university where I went to school at Vanderbilt. And uh, we had met 33 years ago. And she was one of the first people on a plane to come and see me after the fire. Um, she was the only person that didn't make it about her. You know, everyone else was like, oh my God, this is so terrible. You know, just like, yeah, it's really terrible. Like, don't cry. Like, go cry with somebody else. Don't cry with me. And um, anyway, her name is Kate Askew, and she's sitting here today. And um, and she came. I said, Kate, I can't stay here anymore. And she came and got me. And from this, some other place in Tennessee. And um, she's like, all right, I'm going to get you out of this popsicle stand. Let's go. So we got home, and um, Jess Askew was there, her husband, and Mary Reed Askew was there, her daughter. She came up from college. And they, I, I remember they all just were looking at me. And meanwhile, you know, clumps of hair coming out. I'm gray. I'm a wreck. Um, and they were like, you know, um, they just loved me. They called Helen Porter, and they got Dr. Rick Smith on the phone of the Psychiatric Research Institute at the University of Arkansas of Medical Science here in Little Rock. It's pretty good, huh? <laughs> and, um, and he came in on Super Bowl Sunday, and he said, you're not crazy. You're sad. And there are these big, giant nerves that have been severed with this trauma. And the only thing that's going to fix that is love. And you're going to have to let people love you. And he introduced me to Dr. Betty Everett. And she saw me sometimes every single day. And Dr. Smith saw me every single day. And I went to Cosmo every single day from the very first day that I got here. And Kate and Jess and Mary Reed would take me there and they'd wait outside for me because I didn't know anybody. And I'd just go in and share and then I'd run out the door at the end. <laughs> and, uh, and those three pieces saved my life. Oh, I'm sorry I'm taking a long time on this part. Ugh. And the Cosmo was a fellowship that rose around me. It was the community that rose around me. And it does that for you, whether you've lost your children, or you've uh, wrecked your car, or you have 15 DUIs, or you just want to get sober. It, whatever it is that you need, that community will be there for you because there is always another human being that understands your suffering, always. And that has been my experience. <laughs> So this is the path I have chosen, a place in our world where I hope I can make a difference in the names of my girls, Lily, Sarah, and Grace, and for girls and boys everywhere. We should not exist. Think about my 250th to the power Neanderthal grandma and how I made it to this day standing before you here in Little Rock. Mathematically or mystically or however you want to look at it, it is certainly a miracle that I am here, and I believe it's a miracle that we are all here. Today, all of you are making a difference. The fellowship and love that was freely given to me at Cosmo 
is available for every person in this community who desires it. For every person who suffers from addiction. Thank you for letting me celebrate and hold up this pillar of our community here in Little Rock. I really appreciate this incredible opportunity. Thank you. Another quick thing to say, um, and that is that um, I started a foundation um, that I fund, basically, so I'm the only person that gives money to it, but it's fine. And um, anyway, it's called the Other 364 Foundation. And I started it um, after my um, three girls went to the other side um, because um, I wanted people to love the way that I was loved that one day um, every, three, every day of the year. So the other 364 days of the year. Anyway, the point is, is that um, I have chosen to make a donation to the Cosmo Foundation of $50,000 to help grow this wonderful place. Okay, hold on. I, I'm actually doing this to ask you um, to think about the enormous difference that this incredible place, Cosmo, has made on so many people's lives. Co the Alcoholics Anonymous, which I'm not allowed to say, but anyway, it, whatever, it, it was the third it, this is the third place, Little Rock, Arkansas is the third place where uh, AAA started and the first place that started with only the big book. And when Sterling Cockrell um, sent for the books, they messed up and uh, they sent them to the wrong address and he never got the books. And so he, being the miracle he is, wrote again and asked for the books again, and he got them the second time around. Um, I can't tell you what a miracle that is. Because, um, you know, when you're an addict and an alcoholic and whatever, it's so easy to give in and just say, you know what, F it, I'm not gonna, why bother, you know? And so here's this guy getting the books again, you know, and starting one of the most powerful chapters in the United States. So, you know, I'm giving back what I can give back. You know, I don't have my three little girls anymore. Um, so I don't have to save for college and I don't have to, you know, do all the things I used to have to do. Um, and so this is my way of, you know, giving in their names. Um, so this is my way of asking you, whereas you have been so generous already, and many of you have actually given so much money already to Cosmo. Um, I know I gave my dollar every day. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, you guys have been really generous to even want to come and see me today. I mean, I'm so honored. Um, but really to support Cosmo is what you've done. And so there are um, cards on your table. If you feel like you can give a little more, um, Craig told me that you guys are real close to hitting um, what you'd like to hit for April, I guess, or May or something, March. And anyway, he'll tell you more about that. But um, I'm just saying that um, you know, if you can, it would be incredibly welcome and we would be most grateful. So thank you.